Buddha once said, holding on to anger is like grasping a hot coal with the intention of throwing it at someone else. It's you who gets burned. So I say, throw that hot coal. What, that's not what Buddha meant? Well, was he faced with a bunch of killer cops and white supremacists? Whoever thought bigotry would go away with time and the internet was wrong. Bigotry is as strong as ever. It's still killing people every day. I hate it. I hate bigots. Don't you? It's okay to hate bigots. They're cruel people who would gladly kill or otherwise victimize millions of people. Why wouldn't you hate them? Is it because you've been told never to hate and that hate is the same as bigotry? I think we can do better than that. I'm Chris and this is what had to be said. This video was made possible by Stories of Shadow Raids, the awesome new game that's um, got a lot in common with all the other awesome games actually. But this one, uh, no, they're the same. Every day, people are having their freedom and their lives taken away from them. Naturally, they resist by whatever means they can, and good for them. The funny thing is when people say, you're full of hate, hate begets hate. This is not the time for hate. You're just naturally hateful people. They're condemning people for fighting back. They want you to think you should just roll over and accept anything other people do to you or rely on the cops like a good citizen because the alternative is to hate, and hate is bad. They say that to shut you up. That's it. If someone kidnapped their kids, they would hate that person too. They just don't care about threats to other people. They want their lives to continue without having to think of your problems. The root of hate is fear. So who or what we hate reflects our fears. Well, what if our fears are reasonable and based on facts? What if someone is threatening your existence? You still can't hate them? Makes you as bad as them, right? Bigots are always talking shit about the groups they look down on. Like people with darker skin, the wrong religion or passport, who, who, or who just don't identify the way the bigots want them to, about how they're the cause of our problems and we need to kill them or lock them away or enslave them. How would you feel if people were talking like that about you? Trying to stir up violence against you, trying to get you killed, trying to get everyone to fear and despise you? It makes sense to get angry. Not just if you're the target of bigotry, but if you just have a conscience. Meanwhile, complacent people who don't get angry are part of the problem too, because they're the ones who tell people who are angry that it's not so bad, calm down, smoke a joint, take the high road, which solves nothing. I can't speak to all of them, just the ones Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, in his letter from a Birmingham jail called the White Moderate who is more devoted to order than to justice, who prefers a negative peace, which is the absence of tension, to a positive peace, which is the presence of justice, who constantly says, I agree with the goal you seek, but I can't agree with your methods of direct action, who paternalistically believes he can set the timetable for another man's freedom, who lives by a mythical concept of time and who constantly advises the black person to wait for a more convenient season. Shallow understanding from people of goodwill is more frustrating than absolute misunderstanding from people of ill will. Lukewarm acceptance is much more bewildering than outright rejection. So why tell people not to get angry, not to fight back, to wait for official responses to maybe solve the problem when you know they won't? I've made a video on this before. Anger helps solve problems. It makes things clearer to us, helps us focus on our goal. In fact, it can feel good, like a drug, which is why outrage news gets so many views. Telling people not to be angry invalidates their anger and plays to the advantage of the powerful one in the negotiation. 
Civility, meanwhile, is the tool of the powerful. It's valued because the people in power can be polite and civil while declaring war on you, and the rest of us can be ignored or arrested for getting angry. They might just be having a polite debate over your existence and claim not to understand why you're so hostile. Polite bigotry is no less bigotry. I think we should work to understand the roots of our emotions, not suppress them. Think about the things you hate. You feel motivated to do something about them. I've always been skeptical of the word intolerance, too. I don't tolerate racism. Ipso facto, I'm intolerant. I don't see it as a problem. Tolerating bigotry is a problem. Liberals also say they're against intolerance, but they mean overt bigotry. And as always, they're doing nothing when it really matters. Stephen Fry recently tried to both sides the issue of mounting calls for the genocide of trans people by saying the two sides should stop seeing each other as enemies. That puts him firmly on the side of the powerful, because it invalidates the anger of the people with targets on their backs and supports the status quo. I guess he's just too comfortable and cowardly to take a stand. I'm guessing a lot of the same people who say hate is wrong are also pushing for gun control. They don't want victims of racism and other bigotry to be able to defend themselves. They want people being targeted for death for their identity to go drink tea and meditate to solve the problem. You won't take guns out of the hands of people who are using them for their dreams of genocide, because they're part of a global network supported by states and they will be provided with guns. But you will take them out of the hands of people like this who've been using them to defend their communities against the right. Not all bigotry is visible, especially if you're not the target of it. Right-wingers are skilled at covering up and deflecting their bigotry. If you accused, say, the Proud Boys of intolerance, they could say, but we have black, Asian, and Latino members, because they do. So they're tolerant of other races, all these words in quotation marks, of course, but they're still violent bigots who shouldn't be tolerated in public places at all for the safety of anyone on the long list of people they disapprove of. If you tell local people they should tolerate gangs of Proud Boys or Patriot Front neo-Nazis marching around their neighborhoods because tolerance, you're supporting today's fascist movement. And I don't use the word fascist lightly. So stop being so comfortable and tolerant and start getting angry. I think it's, it's misleading and distracting to hear bigotry confused with hate and intolerance. I read in a book someone described Stormfront as a hate website. It's a neo-Nazi website. Why speak in euphemisms? The FBI call, calls racist mass killings racially motivated hate crimes. It's racist violence. It's bigotry in line with the U.S.'s long history of bigoted murders. The shooters are nearly all misogynistic young male white supremacists. Fascists. Influenced by fascists online. Which, by the way, is why we should not be calling them extremists either. I used to think extreme, or the far right, meant it only comprised a very small percentage of the population. But these people have become the right wing. All the most popular right wingers in North America and Europe are stirring up violence against trans people and anyone else they decide is their enemy. Any moderates who claim to exist have been sidelined and criminalizing the teaching of history, getting an abortion, and having a trans child have become basic Republican policy. So why mince words? They're modern-day fascists, and their members and voters enable them. If people hate you, maybe you shouldn't support the fascist party. I saw this tweet, unsurprisingly written by a journalist, with the term bias crime to describe an attempt to terrorize the local Muslim population. Couldn't think of a better word, huh? You hear about 
hate groups like the Proud Boys or some other wannabe brown shirts, and I keep thinking how much that term downplays how dangerous these people are. They're white supremacists. It's too bad more people don't feel comfortable saying that. Call a spade a spade. That said, I don't have a better term than hate group. And I'm not telling anyone what to say, and, and uh, the word is too entrenched anyway. There might be better terms out there, but I'm not aware of them. I'm just saying, let's bear in mind what's really going on. It's not that bigots hate people, or at least not necessarily. It's that they consider people subhuman, to be hurt, enslaved, or killed because they're different. They think of people as cockroaches because of the way they were born, because of things they can't change and shouldn't be expected to change. It's not the same as hate. It's much closer to contempt. Someone pretty much admitted it in this interaction. We don't hate you. We just think your existence is an insult to God. So they learn to write people off as backward, unworthy of respect, taking up resources that are supposed to be for my group. They might see people as prey, but cloak it in rhetoric about just defending themselves and wanting to keep their community safe. They think bullying and harassing people is fun, and they want people to be intimidated so they can have power over them. They want to dehumanize people so they have free reign to treat them like shit. That's not the same as hatred. Neither racism nor anti-racism is some irrational, knee-jerk response to something people don't like. They're about power and freedom, respectively. Another example of the contempt bigotry is based on was in the Matt Walsh documentary, What is the Women's? He asks this professor, takes up his time pretending to be asking in good faith, he answers to the best of his ability, and Matt basically eye-rolls the whole thing. The professor gives a nuanced answer to a complicated question, and Matt plays the whole thing for laughs. He doesn't even play what, what he said, just, just some music over a montage, to show it's a long answer. He doesn't listen. He doesn't even give his viewers the chance to listen. He knows they don't like to think. They just figure, if it's not a short answer, preferably one sentence, it must be bullshit. So there's no need to listen to these people. Let's just dismiss them. See? Contempt. Bigotry has nothing to do with mental illness, either, so please don't throw mentally ill people under the bus every time there's a shooting and distract from the root of the problem. It's not necessarily ignorance or poor education, either. Just because people claim to espouse ridiculous ideas about race and gender and history doesn't mean they actually believe them. They might be using them to play out their own cruel fantasies. If you think of someone as the enemy, you might want to know more about them. White supremacy is about power. It's ideology, not nature. You don't learn ideology by accident or because school didn't warn you about it. You learn it from parents and schools and church and media and the people around you. When you feel contempt for others, cruelty or extermination become ends in themselves. When you realize the cruelty is the point, you can begin to understand all right-wing policy proposals. Why are they so keen to punish trans people lately? Because there's already a lot of prejudice against trans and non-binary people, so they're easy targets. Anyone who doesn't conform to the white, cishet, able-bodied ideal is a problem, an enemy, a threat maybe to our whole existence. And none of this is new or out of nowhere. Today's bigots are the intellectual descendants of centuries of justification for dividing the world up into us and them. The U.S. especially has always had a penchant for bigotry and genocide. Hans Landa's take on bigotry gives some insight into what contempt for whole types of people feels like. You don't like them. You don't really know why you don't like them. All you know is you find them repulsive. People who are less honest than Hans try to justify their feelings with logical arguments and made-up news stories, but they've been conditioned over years to be repulsed by certain people on sight. 
You can call that hate if you like, but I think it's closer to disgust. Hate puts you on the same level as your enemy. The right-wingers shooting up gay clubs and black churches see their victims not as people, but as vermin to be stomped out. That's why they've raised the stakes all the way up to calling them groomers and pedos, to incite mass murder. These people and their predecessors have always tried to associate any kind of nonconformity to gender or sexual norms with pedophilia, but recently they've seriously ramped it up. Their domination of social media, including YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter, has given them millions of supporters who parrot their words and amplify their lies instead of questioning them and realizing they're just bullies. And adult bullies can use their grown-up brains to justify anything. So bigotry requires contempt, but also indifference. Ironically, indifference is a really powerful force. The really right-wing people know they can't make everyone want to commit genocide, so they dehumanize the people they want to kill and spread indifference among the undecided. Every book I've read about the psychology of the Third Reich talks about the power of indifference, about how regular people could probably have stopped or slowed the Holocaust, but had been conditioned by years of propaganda to not care or think maybe they deserved it. A similar indifference towards trans people is precisely the attitude the right wing is trying so hard to foster today, and they've obviously had some success, hence the murders. Put contempt and indifference together, and you can get away with anything. Did American slave owners hate black people? How could they? Why would rich people surround themselves with people they despised? No, they felt superior. They felt the slave's life held no inherent value. It was a tool, not a person worthy of respect. You may have noticed these feelings persist today in employers with regard to their employees. Sure, you've got COVID, but you have to come into work anyway. None of it is hate or intolerance. It's indifference, incentivized by the power structure. When one of their possessions died, did slave owners go, Oh no, this is a tragedy. Did they go, Good, one less black person. I guarantee their first thought was, how much are slaves going for at the moment? So the owners had their indifference and they indoctrinated poorer white people to feel contempt for black people, so cruelty would be easy, even rewarding. These relationships continue to this day, with middle-class whites reveling in cruelty against vulnerable people and indifferent ruling-class whites who can divert attention from their own actions and keep poisoning the world unmolested. Meanwhile, back under slavery, there were people forced by chains and whips and runaway slave patrols, you know, the police, to do everything the master said. Do you think they would be unjustified in hating the master or the people holding the whips? It's hate, and hate's bad, right? They shouldn't fight back. That'll just make things worse. They need to learn to get along. That's what you sound like, Stephen Fry. I've seen videos of colonized people hating on symbols of the state that oppresses them, and people will actually say things like, their society is teaching kids to hate. Maybe they hate having their friends and family killed or locked up for defending their land. Or maybe it's just irrational and baseless hate. Who can say? At present, the rhetoric against queer people has been escalating rapidly, and the shooting at Club Q in Colorado Springs this week is an obvious result. The right wing has some serious blood on its hands. In fact, they've been taking advantage of this mass shooting to encourage more like it. Libs of TikTok, the morning after the shooting, justifying killing random people because drag queens. Tim Pool this week, justifying the shooting by claiming they were grooming children, which of course they were not. Matt Walsh, this week, saying they deserved it because they're trying to turn your kids queer. They just make it up. But ignorant, bigoted people lap it up. 
these people will continue to get their targets killed until someone stops them. I think it's acceptable to do anything to stop them. You know these people have addresses, right? Right-wingers love this conflating of hate and bigotry because whenever they say something designed to stir up violence against marginalized people, others call them out for it. And the next day they can play the victim. Yesterday, a, a bunch of people found my post. You know, the one where I said it would be better if there were fewer trans people in the world. People came here and called me names and said they hope I got attacked. These are hateful, evil people. And now you know, you can see why I was right all along. They love claiming to love free speech because then they can say anything they want. Someone else goes and kills for them and they can deny all culpability because, hey, I didn't pull the trigger. They know their words are killing people. That's why they're saying them. I say it's okay to hate everyone who supports this violence. I hate everybody currently, openly, daily encouraging violence against queer people for being queer and saying they're pedophiles. And frankly, I'm beginning to lose patience with the people who don't care or think the solution is to disarm victims. You know the biggest hate site on the internet? This YouTube channel, because here we hate police, and prisons, and poverty, and corporations, and war, and right-wingers, and liberals waffling on genocide. Same with all the other it-had-to-be-saids out there, vocalizing their anger at what's going on, and their hatred of the system oppressing their people. If your response to all this is a, well, that's not what's meant when people say they don't approve of hatred and intolerance, well, that's not what they're saying. They could just say what they mean, which is presumably that white supremacy or bigotry against queer people is wrong. And for the record, anti-queer bigotry is part of white supremacy. Why not say any of that, though? Why hint at the elephant in the room? Why confuse the subject? People put this blanket ban on hate. No room for hate. There's plenty of room for it. How do you think oppressed people get themselves free? With flowers and petitions and asking nicely? What, you've never listened to Malcolm X or Kwame Ture? Maybe it's time to. Buddha also said, hate doesn't dispel hate. Only love can dispel hate. And that's why I think the anti-racist's feelings toward racism can't fully be conveyed by the word hate. Anti-racists and anti-fascists are motivated by love. They have quite reasonable fears that fascists will kill more innocent people. In this sense, hate feels like righteous anger. The opposite of bigotry is a love for people, and as part of that love, a desire for freedom, justice, community, and sympathy for all, and a hatred of people who would take it away. Just make sure your hate is directed at the right targets. It's easy to yell at your partner or smash something because you had a bad day at work, but it's not helpful. But if you think of hate or anger as a limited resource to be used strategically, it can destroy the fear, anxiety, or despair that stop us from taking action. It can focus us on the target and prompt us to do things we wouldn't usually have the courage or conviction to do. Bigotry requires refusing to listen to people, because if you knew them, you would see them as individuals just as worthy of respect as anyone else. So you could say sympathy is one of the opposites of bigotry. But it's not the same with people you hate. We all have quite reasonable claims to hate people like Nazis and warmongers. You can sympathize with people you hate. You can sympathize with people while you're killing them. Sympathy is incidental if you think what you're doing is the right thing to do. I sympathize with pretty much everybody. Abusers are often victims of abuse. Even the richest, most confident people suffer, too. Doesn't mean they should be left alone to continue doing what they're doing. So as you pull the trigger, you can think about how unfortunate it is you had to do so. If you're angry, if you hate someone or something, there's a reason for it. I don't think you should repress it, but find its causes. If you understand a situation well enough, act on your anger. 
That's what people in Minneapolis did when they burned down the police station in 2020. And the power structure finally started paying attention. Turns out anger is a pretty good motivator. Don't let anger and hate rule your life and make all your decisions, but do let it help you get to the bottom of your problem and motivate you to solve it. So please don't tell us not to hate. Please don't tell people under the threat of violence to be civil. Please don't tell people looking for justice they should opt for peace. Peace is the status quo. Sure, it's not peaceful for the people the system robs and kills, but if we don't see it, it's peaceful to us. I don't want peace. I want disruption, disturbance, agitation, people embracing their anger and unleashing it at the right targets. Then we'll see some change.